Unfortunately, section one is a little bit behind, or I am behind in section one, whichever way you want to interpret it. So I may spend, maybe slow down a little bit so that we can catch up. Uh, but I posted all the videos so far. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look at them, but all the videos are up to date. Okay. So we were talking about rotating on balance. And if I summarize that, uh, basically what we were talking about and I said it's one of the most important concepts in mechanical vibration, is the harmonic or harmonically excited, how about that, that's better, harmonically excited damped systems. So this is, this is a, topic that we're going to spend a little bit more time on that. So, so far, what we have done here, we learned how to find, how to divide the frequency response function in the case of down systems. We demonstrated that this frequency response function has really important applications because the, say, maximum displacement of, an, of a damped system would, in general would be what? Would be this max times the corresponding static displacement. We also demonstrated how to use this H R max to find the damping ratio in the system. In fact, we saw that you can see that approximately the maximum value of frequency response function for the case that zeta is less than 0.707, that is when all these responses are above this R equal, above this line. So for this case, the maximum value is this, which we call this, of course, the Q of the system, and that's an easy way of measuring the damping ratio. So these are some of the applications of harmonic excited damp system. The fourth case that we studied and we we're going to continue is rotating on balance. We're going to further get more deeply into that. So what was the rotating on balance? Rotating on balance was a special case of harmonically excited damp systems in that in the normal case, right, you have basically a system which is subjected to a harmonic load that looks like this. In the case of rotating on balance, let's say you have a structure that is moving and then you have this machinery. This, somebody gave the example of laundry machine. Uh, you have your laundry machine that this is the little so these are your clothes that causing unbalance is rotating. So I call this, if I enlarge this, the distance from the unbalance, which we call the M sub E, to the center of rotation E, the equation of motion then became this, as we derived it last time, was M sub E times E omega squared, okay, divided by 
1 minus r squared squared plus 2 zeta r squared times sine omega t, okay? And therefore, in this case, of course, we manipulated this a little bit. So what I did, I multiplied this by omega n squared divided by omega n squared. <coughs> so these two became uh, basically r squared. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, this was divided by k. So we simplify that, and it, it turned out that what we call the frequency response function in this case became what r squared divided by 1 minus r squared squared plus 1 minus uh, I mean 2 zeta r squared. Okay. So the, in case of rotating unbalanced, in, as compared with the regular harmonically excited systems, the, what we call that the frequency response function has a r square in the numerator. Okay? Or in other words, that came from the fact that the forcing function had a component, I mean the amplitude, that was frequency dependent. It's not a constant amplitude, but it's also is a function of the forcing frequency, which is caused due to this rotating unbalance. So we wanted to plot this and see what the difference is between the case of rotating unbalance, where we have obviously, of course, <coughs> also a harmonic forcing function, and a regular case of harmonically excited system. I think that's where we stopped, right? Or that's how far we went. So let's look at this function, okay? We know how this looks like, right? So I'm gonna do this. I would put f of t is f zero sine omega t, okay? That is a regular case of basically uh, forcing function as we had that uh, before versus I will put it as what? I will put it as F zero or depending on how you, you, you do it, I would, uh, okay, M forcing function is M sub e times e omega squared sine omega t, okay? In this case, h r, the frequency response function, is this. I'm not going to rewrite this radical. Be the same. In this case, let me call this, so that I differentiate between the two, h r asterisk. Doesn't mean this is the complex conjugate, it's just, I'm just using that notation. Would be like this. So we've seen how this looks like. You had an R, this is R equal to one. This is the static response level. In other words, uh, basically, this is where frequency response function was. Um, uh, the, re the frequency ratio is zero. That means the frequency response function shows that the static and dynamic displacement are the same. And this is how we discuss that. As the damping ratio increases, you see a shift of the peak value of the response going to the left of r equal to one, okay? And of course, obviously, this is for the case that zeta is less than 4707, and as zeta increases beyond 4707, all these curves fall below. Yes? Uh, for the, is that supposed to be omega uh, sub n? 
for the forcing function? Oh, no, this is omega. I thought we canceled that out. Yeah, I did, but I went back to the original. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, you know, if you do that, uh, you can actually basically uh, say, okay, it comes out to be ME uh, over, uh, over K times R squared. Because can you not have R squared and omega in the same, as part of the same? Uh, yeah, this is this part. Uh, a good point, good point. I didn't go, uh, I didn't simplify this. But if you simplify that, okay, what it becomes would be actually M sub E, okay, um, times E divided by M, okay, times R squared divided by this. If you simplify that, that would become this. So I'm only considering this part, which is basically analogous to the case of the force harmonic, this. In the case of force harmonic, what this was, was F0 over K. In this case, F0 over K is this. In reality, actually, F0 over K is this part. But what I did was, instead of you know, showing it that way, I want to convert it such that I have R, and everything is in terms of R and zeta and R. So it turns out to be that, OK? But the point is that if you look at this plot, all of them, OK, all these curves, at r going to infinity, okay, response goes to zero. That's one observation. Another observation is, as we said, as zeta <coughs> increases, as long as, of course, is less than 0.707, the peak of the curves shifts to the left. Now let's plot these curves. Let's see how they look like. So I may, in, uh, just in order to plot this, I may, in fact, sort of rewrite this so you can actually see that. So you have 1 minus r squared squared plus 4 zeta squared r squared. That's what we have, right? So what happens at r equal to 0? If you look at, at r equal to 0, it becomes 0, right? At r equal to 0, because this cancels out, this cancels out, we have 0 over 1, right? So at r equal to 0, you see that actually h is 0. So no matter what the value of zeta is, okay, at r equal to 0, there is no movement, which you can think of it, right? Your laundry machine is not operating, right? And you have no displacement, okay? So all the curves start at this point. Now let's see what happens. As R increases, you will see a behavior like this. You increase the damping This further increase the damping is this, and as you actually increase it further, 0.707 or more, you get something like this. What is this? What is the difference between these two? First of all, at r is equal to zero, as I said, a all these curves start at point zero. As r goes to infinity, very, very large ratio of the forcing frequency to the natural frequency, in contrast to here, that the response goes to zero, the ultimate response approaches, okay, in other words, h approaches one, 
That means u max, it approaches basically in a way the static displacement in contrast to that. You can prove this, of course, because if you take, if you factor out r squared numerator and denominator, right? So here you will have something like, this would be for, this part would be four zeta squared, which is a constant, okay? This part, you have r to the four, in other words, if you expand this, if you just want to prove this, okay? This is one plus r four minus two uh, r squared. So, oops. So if you take r squared out, you will have, this one would be one over one r squared plus one minus two zeta, I mean minus two, uh, actually, over r squared. So as r goes to infinity, you can see that this approach is one. Because r squared, r squared cancel out to one, and this is just becomes one. As r goes to infinity, this is zero, this is zero, okay? You just have basically this and this. So this approach is one. Another observation is, as r increases, here, as, as damping increase, you see, the shift of the peak goes to the left of r equal to one. Here, I'm sorry, as damping increases, not r, as damping increases, you see that the peak of the response shifts. First of all, all the peak values are, in contrast to this one, that all the peak values were to the left of r equal to one, in this case, all the peak values are to the right of r equal to one. And as r increases, in fact, these peak values shift to the right of r equal to one. Here, as damping increase, the peak values shift further and further to the left, here, further and further to the right. So let's say you have, somebody gives you a plot of a frequency response function, okay? If you make this observation, you see that the peak, of course you are not given all these characters, you're given for a particular case, and you see the peak is to the left of r equal to one, you say there is an unbalance in the system. That's how, in fact, we detect unbalance. You go to Costco or whatever tire store, they put your tire there to rotate it, they, on the screen they plot it, you see the shift is to the right, that means there is an unbalance in the system. That's how you basically see that. If this was, there was no unbalance, the peak is always to the left of this R equal to one. So that's basically the importance of uh, this, these, you know, this case and uh, at least the comparison you can make between this type of harmonically excited system and the typical one, which basically you have a constant amplitude. So let me do an example problem. I think it's good to solve a problem here to show some applications. Any questions, by the way? No. Um, yes. Um, the data, <coughs> I want the point seven zero seven. Point zero seven. Yes. That's the same. Same. Thing. Same. Yes. That's a nice thing. Yes. And we didn't go, of course, um, in details through that sort of a operation of mathematical, you can do that. In other words, you want to find the maximum, maybe actually a good practice, you find this maximum value, you have to take the second derivative of that, equate that to, I'm set, take the, the, the derivative, equate that to zero, find r for which that is maximum, go through the same operation, you can see that why those shift is to the right. But we didn't go through that, it's just, Mathematics part of it, and we are interested in the application. Okay. okay, so let's do any other question. So let's do an example. Okay, 
we have a beam structure, this may represent some kind of a rotating machinery, okay? Or no, actually it supports a machine. It is is a it is a structure that supports a rotating machine. The roof of this structure, without your chillers or whatever HVAC system set up up on the roof. Okay, so they all have obviously rotating parts. So this beam, which represents the structure, um, supports a machine. That machine weighs sixteen thousand pounds, and the beam. The beam itself, if you go to the table, is made of uh, two uh, standard uh, I-beams, which if you go to AISC tables, they call them S8 by 23. Never mind of that. I mean, that's just the name of those shapes, I-beams. But it all comes down that length of this beam is 12 feet, and the second moment of area corresponding to those shapes, you look at the table, is two times 64.228 inch to the fourth. There are two of these beams, so that's where that comes from, that two comes from. Okay, the motor has a Speed of okay, 300 RPM. In other words, you have a rotating machinery here, has a that speed, and uh, somehow this rotating piece is out of balance because there is a little. If I can enlarge this, if this is the machine has this rotating component. Somehow there's a little guy here, M sub E, which is causing some unbalance, and weight of that, weight of this guy, is given as 40 pounds, okay? And the distance from here to the center of rotation is given as 10 inches. A damping ratio, of the system is 10%. And what is we are going to find is the, uh, in this case, we just want to find the maximum amplitude of this system when this rotating on dollars is causing basically this problem in this rotating machine. So we just want to know as a result of this unbalance, how the system is going to experience a displacement and what is the maximum displacement value. So let's do that. Okay, so um, omega, or the frequency of this uh, rotating machinery is 300 R P M. We need to find R value. So. The first thing is the K is what? This is simply supported beam, so the stiffness is what? 48 EI over L cubed. If you want to model that as a, in other words, if I want to model this as something like this, right? So what is this K value? So it's 48 EI over LQ. Um, e is also given, I forgot to put that in here. E <coughs> is 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. Okay. One thing I do not like about these English systems, you know, these units have no character. <laughs> you know, for instance, in metric system, this is what? Pascal, you know, somebody's name after it, right? You recognize the contributions of those individuals, right? 
When in metric system, it's just as I said, you have no care. PSI, what does that mean? Pound per square inch, you know, it's just. It's so, kind of self explanatory, actually. It is, <laughs> it is, yeah, no, that's true. But, you know, that way you recognize at least somebody who has done that. So, yeah, that's true. It's easier to say, okay, what that means. But, if I, but slug is one thing that I do not understand. Slinches. I love the slinches. <laughs> right. But anyway, so uh, K is that. So you evaluate that as 48 times 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. Then I is given 128.4. Divided by L is 12 feet, convert that to inches. Okay, so this <coughs> would be 61,920 pound per inch. Okay. All right, so you need to find natural frequency because we need the ratio. Natural frequency is K over M, so this is K, 61,920. The weight was given of 16,000. Did I give that somewhere? Right, that's actually the weight, so it's 16,000. You divide that by, what, 386. That will give you 38 point, um, 65 radians per second. This frequency is given as uh, RPM. You need to convert that to also radians per second. So omega is what? 300 times 2 pi over 60 second, right? 2 pi meter per second. That comes up to be 31.41 radians per second. Okay. So now you find the ratio, the ratio which is omega over omega m, which is what we need, would be what, 31, 41 divided by 38, 40, 65, that gives you point eight one three. okay? Yes. The cube down the bottom part of your oh, case. Oh, this one? Yeah. Here? No, no, on K. Uh, 12 times 12 should be cubed. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right, yes. Thank you. But this is based on that. Any other questions? Yes. Where is the G cosine? Oh, the converting it to slug. Uh, okay. Right, yeah. That's what my colleague, uh, Glenn Thorncroft said that he has actually a slug. I should bring it to class. Have, have you seen that? I have a, it's heavy. It is. We were talking about, about 39 pounds. 30, 32 right? pounds. Yeah, 32 pounds. Yeah, it's heavy. Especially when it's lumped, it feels even heavier. Right. So anyway, so um, that's the ratio. So we want to find the maximum displacement, right? So in the case of reg regular harmonic load, what was that? That was H max, right, times F zero over K. So in this case, F zero, okay, is M sub E times E times omega squared. Other than that, and this of course is also different. This is what? Okay. Okay, if you do that, you get, uh, okay, you get U max would be um, 40. Oh, let me write down, I don't, let me write separately. F0 bar, okay would be M sub E, which is given, the weight is given 40, right, times, or uh, I'll divide it later by 386, 
This is m sub e. And inch, this is e, right? Times this is squared, which is 31.41 squared. You need to divide it by that thing is 32 times, 22 times 12, so 386. Uh, that comes out to be 1,222 pounds, okay? So, if, please note this. If I, you're the one who raised the question, which was a very good question. So let me clarify that here. Let's see, okay. When it comes to this case, which is rotating on balance, you can either find mu max by doing this, m sub e times e over m times that r squared over this, right? Or in the original form, we had basically f0 you know, was what we had here, m sub e times e omega squared, okay? So if you use this, this is the function, this is the function that you have. So this is F0, right? So your H would be, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, your U max would be what? U max is what I'm going to do here. It's just F0, which is this, over K, okay, times this, right? So well, that's what I'm gonna do. So you just divide this by k. So you have, is that yeah. the R squared one for this one? Not one? For this one, no, if you use this f as zero, right, it would be just that f zero over k times basically this, right? If you decide to use this form, then you have the R squared. But instead of this, what I'm saying is this, okay, is this divided by K. Okay. Right. So, oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So that's easier if you just want to find the U max. So that's what I'm going to do here. So U max then would be the 1,022 divided by K, where is K? 61, 9, 20, okay? Times one over one minus R squared, where is R, uh, okay? Point eight one three squared. Squared plus two zeta is ten percent times point eight one three squared. Oops, what did I do? Squared two zeta squared square root of that. Okay, so this is one minus r squared squared plus two zeta r squared. If you substitute for those values, you get point zero four four. okay? So this is, if I want to clarify that, this is one way of doing it, or if you wanted, you could use r squared over this, Multiply by m sub e, which you have, times e divided by the mass of the system. Should lead to the same answer. Okay. So what that shows that if you have a rotating on balance, very small compared with the mass of the whole system, because mass of the whole system were weight actually of the whole system, I always get confused, was uh, 16,000 pounds compared with 40, so you have a four over 1,600 
or one over what? Four hundred, so it's what? Um, 2.5, or point zero zero two five, right? So 0.25% almost of the total mass. So you see that this little 0.25% causes about 0.04 inches displacement. Yes? Uh, why are you using 1,600 there instead of 16,000? Where is it? No, I just said this is 40 divided by 16,000. So it becomes 4 divided oh, by Oh, OK. So you see a very, very tiny, I mean, almost negligible, unbalanced, can cause a relatively, if you, in fact, look at percentage-wise, you're talking about uh, this 0 0.0025, that's 0 0.04. So compared with what this little guy is, you get a reasonably significant displacement in the system makes the system operate. So you can imagine why your laundry machine that you put all these heavy weights, your you know, uh, wet clothes in there, which causes a big unbalance. No wonder it shakes so much. It causes a lot of displacement. Okay. Or your tires. A little tiny uh, eccentric mass causes your whole car basically vibrates because of that unbalance. Professor, yes. have you seen the video when someone throws a concrete brick into a washing machine? Oh, is that right? It kind of self-destructs and it's pretty funny to watch believe, just destroy itself. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, that's what you can see that, you know, what happens, you know, that. Uh, or another example is that jet engine. That little blade is tiny weeny compared with the entire mass of the whole system. But if one little gray blade is broken, the unbalance that it causes, it destroys the whole engine, right? I read this hilarious, hilarious story of this woman, an old Chinese lady who uh, was caught throwing coins into the engine of a 747 for quote unquote good luck. <laughs> is that right? Did they arrest her or? No, they, this old lady didn't know better, but it's just, yeah. So she, was, <laughs> so she just wanted to have some fun, right? Oh, uh, good luck. Oh apparently. my gosh. Yeah. Let's go. In the old days, actually, wasn't that a big problem? <laughs> the uh, uh, Air Force jets, I mean, they're, of course, they, uh, you know, those engines, of course, operate at much higher speed than commercial ones. The birds get birds. trapped in these. Uh, that's all. That's what would happen with the uh, miracle on the Hudson. Right. Of that giant bird strike that they had. That's right. Yeah. That's a great example. So, but that's rotating on balance. Okay. So this was the fourth case that corresponds to uh, forced vibration under harmonic flow. The fifth case we are going to study, which of course. Not necessarily for damp system, can be also for undamp system, which is a special case of uh, undamp system. Is a topic that uh, I would uh, call that time dependent. <coughs> time dependent. Okay. Input. Displacement. And the first, the special, one special case that we look at is this time dependency of the input displacement is a harmonic function, which makes a case a forced, a harmonically excited system. But what are we talking about? Let's say you have a system like this, system meaning, of course, anything, right? By now you know what that means. You have this system, you modeled it as a single degree of freedom system. Now instead of this system or the mass be subjected to a force like this, which is what 
we have to study instead of that, it is the base of this system or where it is supported that it is subjected to some kind of a displacement. In fact, let me use the right notation because I'm, I don't want to confuse it between you and this and that. Because I, the notation that I use, uh, I call that, say, y. Okay. So let's say that the base is not fixed, but is actually subjected to some displacement. Example, earthquake. You know that, of course, this building is sitting very nicely, firmly on the ground, but how about the ground shapes, right? Or you have a rotating machinery. For some reason, the floor that it's sitting on is not you know, uh, strong enough, so when that starts to operate, the floor also starts to basically fluctuate. You have a car, right? Car standing on the, of course, uh, smooth, uh, you know, flat surface, uh, moving. Okay, that's uh, clear what happens. But how about if it goes over a bumpy surface? The base, which is this, supposed to be the base that this system is sitting on or moving on, basically. It, also subjective, so vibration, or basically it's what we call a displacement that is time dependent. Okay. So what, what it means that this system is moving with respect to, so far what we've seen is this, right? We were assuming that the system, the mass, is moving with respect to the fixed ground that is attached to, or the fixed reference frame that is attached to, but not a fixed reference frame is subjected to a motion, which we call this time-dependent input displacement. So let's uh, consider the absolute displacement of this mass as z sub t. In other words, z is u plus y. And write the equation of motion. Okay. If you write the equation of motion, obviously, if you set up basically the free body diagram of this, you can see that you have m, z, to the double dot, right, plus cu dot plus ku is equal to zero. That's what this is. If you have this, this. Uh, mass at uh, the spring and the damper are moving uh, in their subjected to this displacement, but the inertia with respect to this would be that. So this is one way of writing the equation of motion. But if you want to express it in terms of either u or z to be consistent, what happens? I need to substitute for z here Okay, if you do that, you get m u double dot, right, plus m y double dot plus c u dot plus k u is equal to zero. So you get m u double dot plus c u dot plus k u is equal to m. This is one way of writing the uh, equation of motion. This is good for civil engineers because usually the, the input is earthquake input is measured with respect to acceleration, ground acceleration. So you have the ground acceleration data given, so you solve this problem. But if you want to write it in terms of, say, z, you can write it like this. You can write u now as z minus y. So if you now substitute that in there, what you get is mz double dot plus cz dot plus kz comes out to be cy dot plus ky. 
this is good for mechanical cases that mostly we are dealing with basically an input displacement. That means machinery sitting on a foundation or car going over a uh, rough surface. Okay. So if I summarize that, I can uh, write this uh, in two, uh, basically these. If you want to establish an analogy for a forced vibration, your FT, which is the right hand side, is either this or is this. This is the general case of time dependent input displacement. So we are going to look at only for time being, we're gonna look at the general case later, but for the time being, since we have only studied harmonic input as it is as the forcing function, let's look at a problem that sort of makes it easier to uh, explain this. Let's say, for example, okay, you have a car, this is a good example, that is traveling on a road that the roughness of the road can be modeled as a sinusoidal function. There's no such a thing, obviously, in the world, but we make that assumption. So, the amplitude of this rough road surface is y bar, I call that y bar. And let's say you, your car, which now you can model as a single degree of freedom system. And let's, for the time being, we assume that damping is zero. Makes it easier. Is traveling at a speed, okay, um, that, okay, the, uh, this, uh, along this, so at distance x, okay, you have basically velocity times t is at somewhere, right? So it's traveling in this direction, but the amplitude of the load like that, and the sinusoidal function. So basically, what you have, if you want to, I would, use this case, right? So we don't have this term. So what you have is this. You have m z double dot plus k z is equal to uh, k y. And y is the, uh, obviously this rough surface, okay? So y is given y is given as sine of 2 pi x over L, where L, of course, is one period of this system. In other words, L is, uh, say, this is L. Let's say this is my L. So that's the problem. Apparently, we could not solve it. We need it for the next time. So the objective of this problem is to find the least desirable speed of the car. What, the one that doesn't cause you to start feeling this. Well,